Hello folks, my name is Mary Cross. I'm the marketing director here at the Farms at Bailey Station. And I wanna say thank you so very much for taking the time to come to this event. Um, there's a big turnout and I'm so excited about that. I uh, wanna tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are a not-for-profit uh, retirement community, a life care retirement community. We have apartments, we have garden and townhomes, which are located behind us. And then of course, Jordan River Health Campus, which is adjacent across the street on the right-hand side. Now with this great turnout for an interest in our community and of course, the topic um, in the Springer Sisters, um, we are not gonna be able to do any tours afterwards, but we are very, um, open to if, if you want to find out more about us you would just simply go back to the registration tables we'll get your name and a sales advisor will reach out to you but with this volume it wouldn't be you know we have folks living here right now so we're in their home and so we will do a personal tour with you so that it's you know you have the chance to see everything in this beautiful community all right so with that said i will turn it over to the springer sisters and Thank you so much for joining us. Well, hello. I'm gonna stand a little bit away from the microphone most of the time, I think. So if you can't hear me, I've never had a complaint that somebody can't hear me, but if you can't, raise your hand. We've been told since we were this little to fight it down. So probably won't have a problem, but I'm Holly Polk and I'm Tanya Springer, and we are so thrilled to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know there are a lot of choices on how to spend your day, and we are honored that you are here to learn about um, downsizing and right-sizing, and we're going to give you our expertise and our wisdom and you know, help you along the way with the journey that you're about to embark upon. And the reason that we are qualified to talk to you about this today is that we are professional organizers. So Holly and I spend our time helping people downsize, declutter, and organize their homes and prepare for big transitions like moving. Um, and we're really readiness to move experts. It's one of the things that we're really, really good at. And we are members of the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals, which is called NAPO. And we have been in business for a little over four years now. And so we are taking our experience and sharing that information with you. So without further ado, yes. and we are really sisters, if anybody yeah, yes. We are sisters. We are sisters. Um, yes. So we will get started. First, by asking how many in here are thinking about downsizing? Ah, oh, great. We've come to the right spot. That's awesome. <laughs> We're going to get started with really talking about downsizing. And some of you may have heard the term right sizing that's popping up. You're thinking, what does right sizing mean? Tanya, why is that now a new term? Well, right sizing and downsizing are essentially the same thing. It's just that over time, downsizing kind of brought a little bit of a negative connotation with it. And it seemed to be like, this is the end. We're giving away everything. I don't need anything any anymore. The joy is over. <laughs> that's not where we are, OK? Right-sizing is for any stage of life. We all should be evaluating our home size and the amount of items that we have in it. And so we like that term and we'll use them interchangeably throughout this. And it's really not what you're losing, it's what you're gaining. And this one right here has real personal experience with this. I've been in Memphis since 98. We were both from Nashville. Been here since 98. We knew we were gonna start this business. She lived in South Carolina, and she joined me here, and tell them a little bit about what that process was. Well, I had a 1,750 square foot home. It was three bedrooms, and I picked an 850 square foot cottage to move into here. In Collierville by the square, so it was, you know, there were a lot of really wonderful things about it, aside from trains, and, but half my stuff had to go, right? And that was really, really, really hard. And so when we say we understand how everybody feels, we've done this um, in multiple ways, personally and professionally. But making the choices and going through the process, it doesn't matter how old you are, it's always gonna be difficult, but we're gonna teach you some tips and tricks to help it be a little bit easier. Right, and some of the things you gain when you move to a smaller footprint, and not necessarily that you are moving to a smaller footprint. I know here at the farm there are various sizes of places to live. A lot of people, though, are moving into a smaller footprint. So when you are doing that, you are gaining so much freedom. What are those freedoms, Tanya? Oh, well, it's a lot less maintenance. And with a smaller size, it's just a lot less to keep track of. There's less to clean. There's less lawn stuff. 
and there's a lot more time for spending time doing the things that you love, which was the primary driver for my decision. You know, my sister has been here since 98, and she has three children, and my parents relocated here four years ago, and so everybody in my family world was here. And so it really became clear to me that this is where I needed to be. And that was something that I had to refocus on every time I was struggling over getting rid of a bedroom suit or whatever else that I knew wasn't going to fit. Like, what is my goal here and what am I going to gain? And it was time with family. Right. Because you really want to focus on people and family. And you'll hear a lot from us. We really focus on intention and purpose and having everything in your life be intentional and purposeful. And that really is right-sizing not only your home but your life. So when you get those freedoms where – Everything that surrounds you has a purpose and is intentionally in your space. It really, there's so many benefits that come along with that, regardless of the space that you're living in. We're going to move on to where to start when you're starting to think about this whole downsizing, right-sizing process. The light bulb has gone off. This is the time. When should we start with this? Well, process? I always say we should have started yesterday. <laughs> um, if this is anywhere in your five-year plan, I urge you to start thinking really critically about this today because time passes quickly. There are also a lot of things in life that happen that we do not expect. Um, and those can be health issues, family issues, weather issues, financial issues, a lot of different things. So do not think, don't trick yourself into thinking you always have time because you don't always have time. And when you run close on time, that's when things become infinitely more stressful. Right. So you want to begin early. Because who in here loves making decisions? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I like it. I like it. I don't. I mean, even making a decision for what's for dinner, where to go eat, all of that. I, no, just pick. I don't want to know. Decision fatigue is real, and we can talk about that later, but just decisions in general can be overwhelming. Decisions under stress, forget it. That is not a situation, if you can help it, that you want to be in. So to prevent that, you want to have a timeline. For Tanya's move, what was your timeline? 18 months. She gave herself 18 months from start to finish to handle all this. Your timeline is a personal timeline, but go ahead and set that timeline. You want, whether it's two years, five years, six months, we really recommend at least a year to get, and we'll, we'll show you why, um, really have a timeline and write it down. Now, that's, does that mean that that's it? And if you miss the timeline, forget it? No. But you really need a timeline because that's going to be one of your motivators, and we'll show you later on why that's important. What's another way, place to start, Tanya? Well, really, in what we just talked about earlier, I'll skip to the end of the line, having a goal. If you don't know what your goal is, and you're just thinking, I've got to move, I know it's time, I've just got to move, you're never going to be motivated to start the process. You're not going to go through the attic. You're not going to start making home repairs. You're not going to do the things you need to do because you don't really want to do it because there is no goal and thing you're going to gain at the end. The goal is so important because times are always going to be challenging. You're going to be working through this process, and you're going to need to remind yourself why it is you even started any of this in the first place. So you have to be very clear on the goal from the beginning before any of the rest of it. And the goal is your goal. It's not your kid's goal. It's not Martha's down the street's goal. It is your goal, and it's a very personal goal, and it could be anything from I want to live near my grandkids, they're getting older, time is flying, I want to see them. It can be, I want a one-level place to live, my mobility is shifting, I don't want to have to deal with stairs anymore. My goal is to have a smaller space so that I don't have to worry about all this maintenance. Whatever your goal is, write it down. And there can be more than one, but have a goal. Because I promise you, throughout this process, you will get frustrated. You will, decisions will become difficult. You're going to refer back to that goal, and that's going to help you. The other thing is to have a destination, and that doesn't mean you have to know the exact apartment that you want to move into, but you need to be really clear about where, and again, why. So is it you want to live in a walking community? Is it that you want to live in the mountains or by the ocean or, again, close to grandkids? I mean, there's no wrong answer here, but if you want to be really specific, like when my parents moved here, they wanted to be within a 10-mile radius of my sister's house, right? My parents... Thankfully, they're in great health, okay? but they're you know, getting older, and so they were cognizant of that. They know that when they need things, they want to not only be close so they can enjoy the grandchildren, but also if they need something, they're close to us so that we can get to them. So these were conscious choices they made. And so really having a destination is very important. Yes. And the last piece up here I'm going to start is to have a workforce. 
And what do we mean by a workforce? Well, you all know that moving, transitioning, it takes bodies to do that. And the workforce includes yourself, your family, and any professional service that you're going to hire. So that is possibly realtors, home stagers, packers, movers, organizers, all of that, estate sales, whatever is in your plan of action, you want to go ahead and start thinking about that. Because one of Tanya's least favorite things she has to do, because she's our communications guru, she does it all, is when what happens when somebody calls you? Tell them we can't help them because they need somebody next week to go through their entire house. And it happens. Um, everybody thinks that time, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but that somehow time is going to miraculously regenerate. And there's going to be time, and I'm going to get to it, and I'm going to do this. And all professionals are, they have full calendars if they're doing a good job. Hopefully, they have people that want to use them. And, you know, and it goes just not for us, but I mean, if you need, you know, a painter or some repairs done on your home or your driveway resurfaced or whatever it is, I know that everybody sees on Facebook and everything else, everybody's like, I need a house cleaner for tomorrow. I need a lawn care service for tomorrow. My home's being listed, you know. There isn't any going to be anybody to help you in that short time frame. And it takes, I would say, I would count on 60 to 90 days if you're going to get the person that you want to work with. I know everyone has at times had to work with somebody that wasn't their first choice because their first choice wasn't available and you were under a time crunch. So if there are certain providers that you want to work with, you want to make sure that you're keeping this in mind. And another thing I want to say, I'm always mentioning family, and she's very right, but also if you really are considering your family as part of your workforce, really think about that. Um, and what that looks like, okay, because not everybody's family. Now, when I moved here, my sweet sister was so excited that I was moving here, and she knew. I'd been living in South Carolina for 13 years, and I was kind of, you know, sad. I was leaving a lot behind, and so I sent my stuff here, and she unpacked everything before I arrived. <laughs> so I walked into a house ready to go. Uh, well, I know, I know. She's fantastic. But it was great because it was a transition for her. I went and packed her. Stuff got moved. I unpacked her, and that allowed her. She rented an Airbnb with her best friends in South Carolina. She spent her final days there with intention and purpose doing what she wanted to do instead of shoving stuff in a box and sweating it. Like, she got to enjoy yeah, those final moments in South Carolina, enjoying the people, which is what's most important of all. And then when she got here, I knew it was going to be hard for her. I mean, again, not what she lost, but what she gained. Fabulous family nearby. But I wanted her to be able to just breathe and enjoy the space and not be overwhelmed with, with all of that. So it really was a blessing to me to be able to give that to her. But, but not everybody has an organizer as a family member that's just going to be there, right? And with family comes a lot of opinions and feelings and emotions. And a lot of things that sometimes just aren't helpful during an already stressful time. So it's wonderful if you have family that wants to help you and they're free and I say take advantage of it. It can be a real bonding opportunity. There are other families that even though you love your children, it may not be the best idea to work with them. You know, they're either feeling really strongly one way or the other. We hear a lot of times. You have it one of two ways. Right. You either have the... Mom, why in God's name are you keeping this? Throw it away. Nobody wants it. Mm. Or you have the, Mom, how could you ever think to get rid of this? It was mine when I was little. I don't want it, but you must keep it. Yeah. You're going to get one of those two. So a lot of times we kind of navigate that gap because we have no emotional attachment to anything. Or, you know, you'll get our opinions and advice. But and that's the great thing about bringing in somebody else is that they're completely objective. Right. So. right. so now that we know how to get started... We're going to talk about our favorite topic, which is clutter. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're going to talk about this is because you really need to know how to evaluate and edit your belongings before you move, and you need to know what the definition of clutter is. Now, there's not just one definition, but we really want you guys to have a real hold on what clutter looks like in your life so that when you're ready to evaluate, it's much easier for you. Now, it's not easy, but having these definitions will really help. So the first thing I think we want you to do is to you know, kind of close your eyes and envision what a cluttered space looks like to you. You know, I think we've all seen pictures or places. Everybody's going to have a, a different room that they might have seen that pops into your brain. But just keep that in mind as we go through these definitions because it's not necessarily just that. Right. So clutter is anything without a place. Well, what do we mean by that? 
It's really that black and white. Anything in your home that does not have a spot is clutter. Things should have a home. You should know where to find them. You should know where to put them back. If they're just living la vida loca, wherever you happen to throw them down, that is clutter in your home. Does that mean we're saying get rid of it? No, but you want to have a purposeful place in your home for the items you choose to keep. Clutter is also anything without a purpose. And people get tripped up on this a lot because it does not mean that the item doesn't have a purpose for someone, but it no longer has a purpose for you. And a lot of time we find this with crafting supplies, sports equipment, um, a lot of things that are kind of aspirational or for a stage in life that was, that's over. You know, like um, if you were a room mom and you made treats for school all the time and you had 17 different cupcake things, but now your kids are gone, you probably don't need 17 of those. So again, if it's no longer serving you a purpose, it is clutter in your space. Clutter is also a product of delayed decisions. This is the big one. And this is one I struggle with this. I think every human struggles with this. And what do we mean by this? This is, oh, should I keep this? Should I not keep this? I don't, I don't know what to even do with this. I, I'm just gonna think about it later and it ends up in the closet until you stumble over it again and you're so irritated that you can see it again, you're still not gonna make a decision. There are a lot of things in your life and in your home that are just delayed decisions because A, we're all busy. Nobody has time to make little bitty decisions as we talked about decision fatigue. I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna talk about decisions about stuff in my closet. But it also, it's emotional. Like decisions are difficult and a lot of delayed decisions are because of emotion. And this is again back to where we're saying it's, it's difficult, it's hard. Refer back to that goal because emotions are going to pop up. It's not gonna be an easy, you know, happy time the whole way. You want to have to force yourself to make those decisions. Absolutely, and we see this in everyday practice, you know, most commonly with something as simple as mail. People don't wanna make a decision about mail and it comes in and it lays in a pile and it lays there for 12 days and then it's a huge basket and then it's so overwhelming you don't wanna, you can't even think about it because there's so much to go through. So it can be something as, you know, simple as that, but it's also, we see it a lot in women's closets. Women have a really hard time letting go of things, either because there's a special memory, clothing wise, special memory attached to them, or it was a size or shape that they were or hope to be again, or have fantasized about at some point, um, and they just can't let go of. So we do see this all the time in different ways. And finally, clutter is a roadblock. I mean, and it's both physically and mentally. I mean, it can be a roadblock if you can't park your car in the garage, and that's a physical roadblock. But then mentally, if you're always thinking about this stuff and you know your attic is full and you just don't really want to deal with it, it's still, it's still in the back of your brain chatting at you, talking to you. You're going to feel guilty. You're going to know that you're going to have to get to it. It's blocking you from new experiences and new things coming into your life because it's so filled with the old. So when Tanya asked you before to close your eyes and picture a cluttered room, were you thinking about any of these things or were you just thinking of usually like cups everywhere and books everywhere and trash everywhere and paper everywhere. Like a lot of people put clutter in a category of trash or just uncleanliness and no, it's in a lot of different um, definitions and it's a lot of different areas in your life and there are different categories of clutter and this is our favorite part. Um, we're going to talk about five of them here. Connie, I'm going to just briefly say what the name, we're going to tell you the names and we're going to act them out and we're going to have you all guess which one we're acting out. <laughs> So aspirational is the first one. So we have broken, broken or out of date, I think would be most accurate. Bargain, gifted, or sentimental. So these are our five top and our actress here will start. <laughs> Woo! Put my hat on. Like my hat. I think I like this hat. I really hadn't looked at it in a while. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you looked at it, you wouldn't like the hat. <laughs> what, what are you trying to say here? I just don't think it's a style that flatters you. Why are you keeping that? Well, I got it back in back in the day at a conference in California. I went and they, you know, got the gift bag, you know, like a corporate swag. I mean, it's free. I, I took it home. It was a gift. I mean, yeah, I probably never wear it, but I mean, it's it's a good hat. <laughs> okay, so which category do we think this is? <laughs> Gifted. Very good. Yeah, there are lots of gifts that you receive throughout your life, whether it be like this example, which is the freebies, the corporate giveaways, the stuff that you encounter all the time in life that you, again, one of the biggest things you run across is it's a good, and we'll, we can discuss that later, but yes, it's a, it's, it's a good hat, possibly, um, but it's not serving 
me any conscience. It's been in my closet for years. I've never worn it. I don't care about it. It's a right. gifted item. Now, these kind of items are easy, right? Plus, I can, I can go through my closet and get rid of these pretty easy. But what about real gifts? Like gift gifts that somebody bought you. Are we talking about that too? We are. Because this is where a lot of people struggle. Um, and we like to talk about it from both sides. As the gift door and the gifty is the recipient. Um, and gifts, one of us is a shopper. <laughs> I do love to shop. And I've had to learn. Like there were times when I would come from South Carolina and I couldn't get all the presents in the car for Christmas. Like it was absurd. And then you start to realize after you see that it leaves the house in six months or nobody plays with it, that this is not money well spent. But gifts sometimes come with strings attached, right? Right. And I like to think of this, I kind of visualize like the Santa sack scenario. You know, the big bag over his back. And every time you give someone, think of every loved one in your life that you give stuff to. And think of the stuff you give to them in that sack. And think that they have to carry that sack around the rest of their lives. Everything you give them is a physical weight on them. Now, for some of us, like myself, I don't struggle with giving stuff away or saying no if somebody wants to give me something. It's, it's not in my DNA to care. This one is the sweeter of the two of us and has struggled for years with my parents passed down stuff or giving her stuff. She will always say yes. So she ended up with stuff that necessarily didn't fit into her home or her what she needed. But think of it as when you're giving some, someone something, especially if you know they struggle with, I can't ever give that away to me. Grandmother gave that to me. I'm never getting rid of it. Or my mom gave that to me. And if you're really just enjoying the sport of shopping, because that is fun to you, but the end of that is filling up the Santa sack for that person, just be aware of that. And it's okay to get rid of gifts that somebody gave you. What is the purpose of a gift? The whole purpose, the reason we give anybody a gift is to show love or appreciation, right? That's, that's the purpose of the gift. It's not the item itself that was given to you. It's the act of purchasing it and then handing it over to you. That's the gift's job, to show somebody how much you care about them. It's not in the physical item. That should not be something that makes you have to keep it forever. Right, so don't feel guilty if gifts you have received throughout your lifetime do not fit into your next chapter. It's okay. And I guarantee you the person that gave you those gifts would not want you to feel guilty. Nobody wants to give the gift of guilt, right? You're giving the gift of love and appreciation, not the gift of guilt. So let that remain if you struggle with it. Because it's not, again, it's not easy. These are not easy decisions. People spend money on you. You feel guilty. But again, you didn't ask to receive any of these items. And if you did, chances are you actually are using them and they're not in a closet or, or whatever. But yeah, gifts are a common source of Hey, I'm ready for movie night. Music and movies. Who's ready? You want to come over? Um, do you even have a VCR player? Um, I don't think I do anymore. <laughs> now that I think about it. And but I can't. It was it was JW's first movie. Like I can't. I don't want to get rid of that. It's the first movie we ever saw in the theater together. So okay. Okay. What type of clutter are we talking about here? <laughs> well, it is sentimental, and it's also and this is where it's broken, can't use, have it fixed. Um, outdated technology. If we had a dollar for every VHS tape that we have come across, we'd be in Aruba right now, honestly. Yeah. I mean, you know, but there are services, and we left some cards back there. Photoberry is one that we use. They're fabulous. They're local. It's a couple that do it. Um, transfer all your stuff to digital. But if you are keeping items, like JW's first movie, which is actually the ultrasound I have of him, which I'm not even going to transfer that because he's likely going to want to watch himself in utero. He is not. <laughs> um, and I'm never going to watch it again. I mean, what, I'm just not. So if it is something you want to keep and you cannot watch it, it's just clutter. There's no purpose. You can't do anything with it. Things that you keep should be well-preserved and properly stored. Walkman. I mean, you get some, some pretty strange looks if you walk around with one of these right now with some headphones with the orange thumb. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't, I'm sure somebody somewhere thinks these are cool still, and there might be somebody that you can donate this to. But if you're not listening to this, if you're using, you know, AirPods and an iPhone now, this is no longer something you need to hang on to. People really struggle with these things because back when we used to buy new electronics, like things were super expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it is really, and you remember how much you saved up for those things and, and all that. But if they're no longer relevant and they're not being used. And if items are physically broken, 
set a deadline, a timeline to get them repaired. If you're not doing that, by the time that deadline came up, you're really not that motivated to get it done. And if you're, again, it doesn't have a purpose in your life because it's broken. Let it go. Set a timeline, okay, I need to have the rip of those pants fixed by May 1st or it's out the door. I need to have that bowl that's broken, the chip repaired by June 1st or it's out the door. And hold yourself accountable. That again will help you make some easy decisions. If you can't decide because it's broken but you're gonna get it fixed and you never get that fixed, there's your decision. It there's wasn't that important to you. Right, it was not that important to you. Oh, I was gonna be so studious and wise and read this lovely, just part one, Mark Twain autobiography that is, oh, 700, 800 pages with the ever so large print that I don't know who to read. This book, man, I had high hopes of getting this read. Right. So what, what is that one? Any of the guess? Aspirational. So aspirational is another really tough category because in our minds, the ideal version of ourselves would have done the things that we bought these items for, right? So that can literally be anything. It can be triathlon gear. It can be you know, yarn because you were gonna crochet. It can be quilting. It can be reading. It can be anything that, again, the best version of you, there's nothing wrong with the current version of you, right? You can let go of these things because if you've had the book for 10 years, like Holly, and you haven't read it, Chances are that's not happening. Now we take it as a prop, and so it's come useful. But it's okay to not have time or the desire to do something anymore. It does not mean anything's wrong with you. Stages in life change. The amount of time you have to dedicate to things changes. And you can pick those back up later, but you don't need to drag around everything that ever interested you. It's just not necessary. Right, and that goes back to that emotion of guilt. You feel guilty. I spent the money on it. I said I was going to do it. I used to enjoy this. My kids enjoy it. I don't anymore. Whatever that looks like, let the guilt go. Tanya says about life is ever-changing, and as, as human beings, we are growing and learning new things all the time. You're allowed to be like, I don't like that anymore. That's great, because I guarantee you something has replaced it. We're always changing. Mm -hmm. And what was even better is that you thought about even doing it. Like, how awesome is that? And you're like, you know what? I think I'll become a painter. And then you're like, I don't really like painting. Great. Move on. You're not a failure because you're not painting. You tried it. You didn't like it, it doesn't serve a purpose in your life anymore because you're not breaking out those paints to paint, let it go. Aspirational clutter is a huge category we see. What's in this box in the closet? Oh, it's dusty, you can tell what's in there? Um, oh, it's some handkerchiefs and a coin purse. I think, is this, is this stuff from Aunt Martha? Oh, I think that's great Aunt Martha's handkerchief and coin purse. Oh. I didn't even remember what it was or that I had it. Hmm, what should I do? What is this? Very good, this is sentimental. And this is wrapped around so many different topics right now, but yes, sentimental clutter is huge. And we're gonna show you, do you wanna do the scenario first of the differences and? Sure. Well, yeah. We're, okay, we're gonna play out real quick what it looks like. Great Aunt Martha has passed. We are all very sad. <laughs> this is Great Aunt Martha's coin purse. She used it every Sunday. She would take me to the Piggly Wiggly and give me a dime and let me go pick out a soda. I have great memories. I would love for you to have this to remember Great Aunt Martha. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, I'll keep this. That's very sweet. Thanks. And where are you going to put it? I'm, I was probably going to keep it in a drawer. I don't know that I'm going to use it in my purse. I don't know that I'm really that. Okay, but it's a small thing, and it's a sweet story. And it and it does remind me of Aunt Martha, too, because I remember she still carried it till the day she died. So this is something I will, I will try to keep. Okay. Now here's another scenario with sweet great Aunt Martha, who's no longer with us. I just got back from Ohio. Great Aunt Martha, rest in peace. Um, this, is, this is all her. So you just take this. This is great Aunt Martha. Uh, well, you know what? You what? Got, remember Great Aunt Martha. There's a bit of stuff to Great Aunt Martha. What, what's even in here? Oh, I don't know. You know Great Aunt Martha loved those garage sales. Who knows? I don't know what's in there, but she, it, it's hers. Like, so you love like Great Aunt, Aunt Martha? Stuff don't you that want she, like, used? It's the stuff maybe she bought at, like, Great Aunt Martha. I mean, she's Great Aunt Martha. It feels like an awful lot. Like, I don't have room to keep that anywhere in here. I guess it's just, but Great Aunt Martha loved you. <laughs> well, I guess I'll just put it up in the attic then. <laughs> So this example 
really shows you. We talk about with sentimental items, and again, we're not going to tell you to get rid of anything. This is a decision on your own. Sentimental items are one of our favorite things in the world. Family history, we love it. Our parents are huge genealogy people. We could tell you where our ancestors came back from way back when. It's important. What you just saw here <clears throat> is a carefully curated collection versus Great Aunt Martha's garage sale collection. Back to the Santa sack scenario. If you're expecting your children to keep everything you've ever touched, everything any relatives ever touched, think of how big that sack is on them. <laughs> then it just gets to be, there's no stories about anything you own because it's literally boxes and attics that are never going to be opened again. It's so overwhelming when you receive bins and boxes of a loved one's things, or even if you yourself are going through all of this, it becomes overwhelming. So we really carefully curate a collection. The way to go. Why so, is it? Well, and it's one small item. And even if I never take this out of my dresser drawer, there's room for it. I know the story behind it. I know why I kept it. And the footprint of it makes it something that I actually can keep. Um, this is going to go up in an attic where it's probably going to get ruined. It's never going to get looked at again. And I'll never think about Aunt Martha. But every time that I open my drawer in my dresser, I'll think about Aunt Martha because this is one small thing. So it's really being intentional with the pieces that you keep and honoring them, displaying them properly, storing them properly, all of those things are very important. And this is an example of sentimental as well. This is mine, this is me at normal. He lives in my cedar chest in my room and he's tiny and his name's Brownie and I got him at the hospital when I was little. My kids know when I'm no longer here, Brownie goes in the trash. This doesn't mean anything to them because my memories are not their memories, especially when it didn't involve them. There is no guilt, Brownie hit the road. But it's not in my parents' house anymore. It's in my house. One of the things we love to tell people is, if you no longer live with your parents, neither should your stuff. Please do not act like a storage unit for your children. Now, there are obviously situations there's always going to be an exception to the rule. You are not a storage unit. If they are adults in their own space, and they're saying, which is what we see quite often, and I have relatives who have done the same thing, oh, here's your high school textbooks and notebooks. Would you, hmm. No, I don't want to get rid of that. I, no, okay, well, you can take them. Well, I don't want to take them. Don't get rid of them, but I'm not taking them. Oh, okay, well, would you like to submit rent every month for me to store your stuff? It's just, again, it's a delayed decision on their part because they don't want to think about it. Like, I don't want to think about my high school yearbooks and all that kind of stuff. Like, I don't want to deal with it. Do not become a storage unit for your children's things. Have them, um, our mother, please tell the Barbie story for those who have not, who have not heard about Barbie story. <clears throat> so my, our parents kept everything. And my mother was very clear on the fact that she would never throw away anything that was ours without our permission. Not something that we said she had to do, but she just wouldn't. Well, a little backstory, they moved in 93 and packed up everything and we were away in Knoxville at college. So we weren't in a position to take anything at the time. So all of our childhood stuff just got put in box in the attic and traveled with them for 25 years to other places and was never unboxed anywhere. So little by little, when my mom would come visit, they would bring stuff or we'd go home, they'd bring down a box and we'd go through it. And every time, this is what would happen. We would open a box and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I love this, I forgot about it. And Holly would say, that's trash. Why are you cutting it? Every time. That's the way we're wired. Now, I didn't ever keep it, but I was excited to be reunited momentarily. So one of the visits, my mother had read somewhere online that, well, she, she found Barbies. Okay, And Barbies, notoriously, I mean, they're made out of plastic. They're not living well in the attic anyway. I mean, time has not been kind to Barbies, and their hair especially. And I'm sure they weren't really, they were in a cardboard box. So all the things that could go wrong did. So she pulled them all out, and there was quite a collection, but she was afraid, like me, of bugs, and she thought there might be spiders in the Barbie's hair that she couldn't see. So she put all the Barbies on an igloo cooler styrofoam tray and froze them for like a week. Until we arrived, and she pulled out frozen Barbies, so any bugs would be dead. And then those immediately went in the trash. Okay? So my poor mother dragged those around for 25 years, laboriously laid them on this tray and froze them, and then they ended up in the trash can. Okay? So most of these things 
Although they are sweet memory, and I was always excited to see them again and remember something for a second, your kids probably aren't going to want this stuff anyway. So don't make up a story in your head that they do. Now, there are going to be kids that do. I'm not saying there aren't. But if you haven't had that conversation, don't make any assumptions that they're going to be devastated if you threw away their stuffed animals. Trust me, nobody wants a stuffed animal from the attic. Their children are not going to play with that stuff. Um, it's just not going to happen. We've been through all of it. And that goes back to the carefully curated collection. If your son had his favorite toy train when he was little, awesome. Keep that toy train. Keep it in a climate control closet in your home. And then when your grandson comes over, how awesome is that? He's probably going to play with that. He's probably not going to play with the cardboard box full of nasty Barbies and all that. You know, that again, back to that carefully curated collection because it will enhance the pie. It will keep it in a condition that your grandkids will actually want to play with it. A lot of times they're not going to anyway, but yeah, keep it in right. the condition that, you know, right. it's going to yeah. be useful. Go ahead. Oh, the red tag of savings. <laughs> oh, these are so cute. I can't wait to use these cupcake liners and little bunny picks. They're on clearance. And side note, I am the shopper, but this is for real something she Oh, I went to a really bad home goods period. So yes, yeah, she, yeah, she had to break up with Home Goods. I did have a break up with Home Goods. So, this obviously is what? Bargain, right? And I was saying this earlier to Holly, and I'll share with you. I was watching a video last night where it showed, it was at a, I think it was a Kroger, but I'm not 100% sure. But it was an item that it was $2.49 on the shelf. It's a yellow tag like it always is. And they go in and they pull the yellow tag off and then they put regular price $2.99 and put a big yellow <laughs> sale tag that says on sale for $2.49. It was always $2.49. But psychologically, you see, oh my gosh, what a great deal. 50 cents off. I like these crackers. I'm going to buy four boxes because it's on sale. But it's not on sale because it cost that yesterday. Right. We Don't see this the all the time. And again, we've both been guilty of it. Numerous times yes. in the past. I've broken up with them. That, that habit is gone. But this will get you in clutter problems really quick. Um, so just be aware, again, intention and purpose. If I needed these, what an awesome thing that I got them cheaper than I was expecting to pay for. I didn't need these. They sat in my closet forever. It took up valuable space that other things could have gone. And I, now they're just, again, another problem. Another problem. Yeah. That we, that we get to use. But yeah, those are all, not all the categories of clutter. But the ones that we really like to talk about because we've run across them most often. Right. And they can be the most challenging. Yes. So now that we've cluttered, 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 we're going to jump into action. What's our first piece of wisdom when you're going to get started on this journey? Well, the most important thing that you need to know is that you want to start with the least emotional areas of your home first. So if you're, you know that you're going to be downsizing and you need to be going through your stuff, you do not want to start with your children's belongings or the thing from your mother's house or whatever it is. You want to start with like a linen closet or like a junk drawer or maybe a toolbox or something. Something that has, a, has less emotion so that you can work on building this decluttering muscle. What do you mean by decluttering muscle? Like what is well, that? It is, it's a mental muscle, but it works just like a physical one does. So just like anything else, the more often that you do something, the easier it becomes. And we're not telling you any of it's ever going to be easy, but you're going to be armed with tools and questions to ask yourself so the decisions will come quicker, you'll feel more confident about them, and it does move more expeditiously as you go. And the more exposure you have to your items, just like we said before, when they got the boxes out and here come the frozen Barbies, it's like, oh, I remember these. There's that moment of nostalgia, right? That, oh, I haven't seen this. doesn't mean like I want these Barbies, I treasure these Barbies, but you get that like endorphin, mm -hmm. serotonin, Oh, this is happy. But then again, if she saw those Barbies every week, then by two months in, she's like, I don't need these Barbies. That initial, ah, is gone. So you may not make the decision right in the moment. You may hold on to a delayed decision. But now that you've seen it and are aware of its existence and you're building that clutter muscle, you'll be like, you know what? I don't need these Barbies. That nostalgia, that moment of awe is gone. And that builds that muscle with that as well. Okay, and the next thing is communicating. So this is with the people that you live with and other people in your life that you may be bestowing items to. So it could be, you know, your grandchildren that you want to gift your china and silver to. Uh, these are things that we want to make sure we're having conversations about. Let's not hold on to things or be afraid to make decisions because we're certain that somebody wants something. If you haven't had an express conversation about it, 
then you're going to want to because you're not going to want to assume that that's going to happen. And Holly's got a great tactic for that. Yeah, well, and this kind of circles back around to the guilt, right? So if you're wanting to give something a large footprint to, and it could be small too, but usually it comes with a larger footprint. Take, for example, a china cabinet. And I say, Tanya, I am bestowing my china cabinet upon you. Here, I will deliver it next Tuesday. Now, Tanya, as I told y'all, is very sweet, and she would never say no. So here comes the china cabinet, and now Tanya can't even get to her table because she's mm -hmm. shuffling to the china cabinet. The proper way to handle this, to really find out if the loved one you're gifting to wants it, is to handle it in this way. Tanya, I have a china cabinet that I'm going to get rid of. I would love for you to have it if you need it. If not, call your Methodist is having a rummage sale in April. They'll come get it. So I'm happy to give it to you, but if not, I'm going to let the church have it. Oh, that's so sweet of you to think of me. Thank you. But I just don't think I have room for it. So I go ahead and give it to the church sale. I think that's a great idea. But thank you for thinking of me. So then you really know. Give an out. Because if you don't, and they have a personality like Tanya's, she's going to feel really bad to tell you no. You want them, that object that you are giving them, you want them to want it. Because that way you know it's going to be cared for. It's not going to be like, oh, God, that china cabinet. Like, they're not going to want it. You want them to enjoy it. And if they don't have the space or want it, wouldn't you want somebody that actually is going to use it and want it? That piece of furniture was made to serve a purpose and a function. Not to sit in an attic or be tripped over every time you walk in the dining room. You just want to make sure that the gifts you are passing on are actually wanted. Because again, that's where that emotion and guilt and anger and because she will tell you, like with family situations with furniture, what's your role if you gift somebody the furniture? You have to let go of whatever's going to happen after that moment. Because and this is a challenging one for a lot of people that we know. Um, let's say that you give the china cabinet to me, and I decide that the perfectly preserved walnut wood that's been hand oiled for 110 years, I'm going to paint fuchsia and put purple knobs on it and display dolls in it. You know? Now, you've given me the china cabinet, so whatever your expectations were are no longer relevant because it was gifted to me. So just know that when you do give something like that, you have to be okay with the outcome. And communicate your family's history and your stories on these items that mean something to you. We don't, we don't know what your items are. Your, your family members may not know what your items are. We stumble across, our parents are, are very much different than us in, in items that they keep. They have a large collection of things. And they love them, and that's fantastic. And most of them have a story behind them. And we don't know the story. Now, we're not keeping everything at all when they're no longer with us. But the items that are really cool or have a story, we would love to hear that. And we're more likely to keep it if there's a story behind it. Now, if it's just some random set of dishes, set of dishes, it's, it's not going to mean anything. But if it's like these were so-and-so dishes and blah, 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 well, I might keep one and hang it on my wall and it will remind me. And that's a great family history. My, my in-law, my mother-in-law has a plate that was literally brought on a boat from Hungary. You know, this one plate, but again, carefully curated collection. What an awesome heirloom to pass down. It's not because it's today, I think the hardest things people are having as far as people wanting, even donation places, are large pieces of furniture, your china cabinets, your entertainment centers, and then your china. And it's, it's just people don't use china anymore, don't appreciate china anymore. It's a different world. So just knowing the stories, talk, talk to your family. We love to hear your story. That's our favorite part about our job it is it's hearing story. people's stories. We love, absolutely love it. And I guarantee you, your family does too. Again, the purpose in life is to love and be loved and surround yourself with people. So even though things are fantastic and we both love things, we have plenty of things in our lives, people over things every single time. But tell your story. Tell why you like this object. Tell what this object is. Where, where is it from? What purpose did it serve for you? What's the story behind it? Again, open those lines of communication. Because then you won't, you won't be angry if, you know, nobody wants this. Well, they don't know the importance of it. I can't believe they're letting great-grandpa's top hat go. He was a star you know, magician in Mississippi in 1922, and nobody cares. Well, nobody knew, you know? I mean, I could have an acrylic case made to display the top hat in my den, and I thought that would be awesome. To me, it's just a dusty old top hat shoved in a box that nobody ever told me about. So really tell your stories, communicate, um, and the more you tell the stories, you will learn what you really love and what you get passionate about. And your kids will tell you, just like we do when we work with clients, 
you can see it in their face. You, you can see when somebody holds something, the emotion behind it, you can see it every time. And you can see if they, you know, be like, oh my gosh, tell me the story, and they'll light up and they'll tell you it, or they'll hand it to you like, oh God, my mother-in-law gave me this, and I'm like, you're like, then let go of it. It is repulsive to you. Like, your body language changes. So just be aware of actually communication. Just communicate. There's not enough communication. You cannot over-communicate. So another thing kind of back to our timeline is if you're donating things, and this is also, I'm just going to add, that a lot of people want to sell things to, and we don't really talk about that here a lot. Um, there's a lot of confusion about the selling of things and what things are worth and, and the time and money invested in that. And I just want everyone to be cognizant. We have a, a great partner that we use, um, Ashley Bang, new to me, Tennessee, and we have her information back there too. But she can sell pieces for you and she takes care of the marketing of that and does that. But a lot of the time, the things that you think are so valuable are not necessarily as valuable as you think they are. Um, and that's really hard to hear for anybody. And just kind of like I said about electronics back in the day or whatever it is, everybody worked hard for what they have. And they made these decisions intentionally and they've had this piece of furniture in their home for a long time. And, and it's, it's a great piece of furniture. You're talking solid wood furniture. Right. It, it is hard to understand it's not that anything somebody would rather have it? the Ikea furniture than your, but it, that just is what it is. Right. Well, because people redecorate a lot more often now and taste have changed and things, but there's no right or wrong thing, but the market's going to dictate what the value of your item is. And you may want to list something for $500 and I'm telling you by all means you should if you think it's worth that, but don't be disappointed when that doesn't happen for you. Um, so there will be a lot of things that you think are going to be valuable. We've watched clients go through this, and then they realize that nobody really does want them at a price. And there's also time and energy put into that and managing that when you're trying to list things. So then they want to donate them. And if you're on a timeline, just remember, it takes about six weeks at this point for somebody to come get these large items. And there are great organizations, you know, NAMI, you know, Salvation Army, you know, American Veterans, all these great places, Habitat, I think, comes and picks up stuff. But you got to get on a list. So you can't say, oh, I'm moving next week and nobody ever came and bought this. What am I, like you have to think ahead, so just be aware of that. And then work in chunks. And what do we mean by this? We mean small chunks, especially when you're getting started because it can be overwhelming. Working in chunks, I am one, I would block off the whole day and let's get going. We are on, the project is on, we're spending the whole She's day. full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. That is how I operate. That is not the way to go about this. No. Back to decision fatigue. We have had clients, we normally work in you know, two to four hour sessions with our with our clients. And we've had clients that at the end of four hours are still bright and sunny and happy and could have kept going, but we're done. We've had clients get physically ill hour, hour and a half in and have to stop. And she is a master at reading people. So she will always know when somebody is done. And that's really where that decision fatigue comes in. It is so real and you don't know it till you start doing it and the way we work um, which is fantastic because again she is amazing with clients great communicator can sense people she is sitting one-on-one -on -one with somebody as I'm bringing the stuff generally is, and it's how that works so again it's a lot of decision making and then you get to the point where either oh just let it all go or I'm keeping it all <laughs> you're, you're one or the other because your brain is done. Not. And it doesn't matter if it is sorting through family heirlooms or dish towels. It's all a decision. And your brain can only handle so many at a time. And every day isn't the same. There are days where four hours is going to be really easy to get through. And there are going to be days where 30 minutes in, you're totally over it. And just know that that's okay. And again, that's why we talk about getting started early. And then establishing categories. So choose categories and sort items according to that. And what we mean by that is, you know, if you know that you have spatulas in four different drawers, get every <laughs> spatula you have out because most people do have them lurking in like a utensil crock and then there's some in some drawers, whatever. And when you realize you have 17 spatulas and you can see all 17, then it's easier to make a decision. It's like, oh, I probably only use six. I like this one for this, this one for that, whatever. But if they're all still spread out everywhere, you're not going to realize the volume of your collection. Yeah. So it's very important that you gather like items together. And we don't mean like dump your entire bedroom at once. We're, we're talking small. And if you're using the everyday use items, 
that will really sneak up and pile up on you. It's your linens. It's your kitchen utensils. It's the tape measure. It's the, you know, <laughs> ballpoint pens. It's the you know, it's all those little things. So really, when we're saying working challenge to establish a category, hey, on Tuesday, I'm going to go pull out all my bath towels and see what I've got. Because right now I have a, I have a four bathroom house. I'm moving to a, a one and a half bathroom house. I probably only need two sets of, of towels, whatever that looks like to you. Okay, I have eight now because my go ahead and start thinking about your categories in that way and have it reflective of the new space you're going to be. And then again, like I mentioned before, just referring back to your goals. You're going to have to time and again remind yourself why you're doing this because there are days that are going to be torturous, days you're going to be sad, days you're going to be grumpy. You have to remember why you started in the beginning or you're going to have a tougher time moving forward. All right. Things that don't budge. Connie would say me because I'm the world's most stubborn human. But things in your transition that will not, will not change are your square footage. Square footage is square footage. That's not going to change. So really wrap your head around what you're in now and what your goal is going to be and the, where you're, like the destination that you've chosen, um, what that square footage looks like. This is important because you know what your current square foot, footage is. You have a you know, ballpark idea of what the new, the percentage should reflect that. And square footage is not the only thing that matters. What a lot of people are experiencing is they may be in a 2,500 square foot house now, and they're moving to a more updated 2,500 square foot house. But the home that they were in was built in 1960, and every room has a wall and a door and all these spaces, and now their new home might have a larger open concept. So while there was space to put all these pieces, small pieces of furniture and artwork and things, these new open concepts don't allow for the same pieces. So don't equate square footage to mean the exact same thing. The, the floor plan and layout is very important. And then time. So you really need to know how much time before we move. Like what kind of timeline do I need to move on? Because that number's not going to, I mean, that's not going to budge. If you've picked out a place and you've signed a lease and you're moving in on this date, or you know that your home is under contract and you've got to be out, so that, you know, like I said before, time doesn't regenerate. It's just our one non-renewable -renew uh, resource, and we've got to make the most of it, and that it doesn't budge. Yeah. So now to the fun part of getting ready to move. And again, like Connie said at the beginning, we are not movers. We're you know pre-move experts. We don't physically move pre people. Pre and, pre and post. Move. Pre and post. Yes. So our advice on getting ready to move. As you are going through the decluttering process, and you run across items that you know you're keeping, but you don't use them, they're not a part of your everyday life, go ahead and pack them. Right. That's, that's just going to be one less thing that you have to do, one less, you know, you're not paying someone else to pack it later on, and you already know what you have, and there's inventory of it. And when you're packing them, most people pack in cardboard boxes, right? That's the industry standard. You're going to pack in the cardboard boxes. One tip that we have is to use colored tape. You can buy, you know, a set of rainbow color, different roll of each color. Assign a color for each room in your house. And then you're just slapping a piece, the green, kitchen is green, you're just slapping a green piece of tape on those boxes. Or telling your moving company or packing company, hey, kitchen is green, please put a piece of green tape. And then on move day, you hang up a green piece of tape in this room so that the mover's not deciphering handwriting, you're not doing any of that. It is a really quick color-coded system. Also with cardboard boxes, huh? It's just meant to be a temporary transporting vehicle, right? So it's meaning to get you from one home to another. It's meaning to get something from the Amazon warehouse to your front door. It is not meant for permanent storage. We cannot urge you all enough not to use that. That's just a little side note. Um, you want to set a deadline to have that cardboard out of your house. So whatever that looks like for you. Some of us, like we unpack people and we get all of it out in a day or two. But if you're unpacking yourself and all of that, set a timeline. Hey, I need to have everything unpacked. By. Set that down, that deadline because if you don't set that deadline, somebody else is going to move into your house, and it's our friend Mr. Rose, mm -hmm. and they love to eat glue in cardboard boxes. This, in addition to the fact that pretty much a lot of things you put in cardboard are going to be ruined. The element cardboard is not made for, like she said, temporary vehicle. So, in the packing process, absolutely cardboard all day long, and then once you get there, please set that timeline to properly store your items because again. You're not going to keep Aunt Martha's coin purse if it's got water stains all over it and mildew because it was in a cardboard box shoved in the attic. Right. And then the next thing is just don't move delayed decisions. So we knew there were things that you might have been struggling with and you weren't sure what you were going to do about it. Really, 
try to make all of those choices before you actually move. You don't want to move six boxes of stuff that you just couldn't decide about just to another place where you still can't decide. So really kind of force yourself to make some of those tough choices. And that's back to that timeline. I mean, you've got to start, like you said, start yesterday. Because there are going to be certain things you're like, well, I'm not sure if that print will look good in that room or not. Absolutely bring it, check it. Again, set a deadline. I will have all excess out by a certain amount of time. But what you don't want to do is move everything in and then you're just frustrated. Because this is exciting. You're going to a new place, a new adventure. This next, again, everything you're gaining is so fun. And you don't, we say arrive and thrive. Like you are ready to take on the world. This is it. We are here. Let's go. You don't want to be tripping over boxes and things and being frustrated in your new exciting space. So, I mean, I have, you know, my mother in law is a prime example of this. I love her to death, but she moved and didn't follow her expert daughter in law advice, but she has a, a two rooms full of artwork. She moved a year and a half ago. They're still full of artwork that are wrapped beautifully by the moving company. No decisions have been made. They were delayed decisions. We're not going to decide. I'll just get, but again, she can't enjoy her space. Because it's full of artwork that's been the old home. It doesn't, it could fit the new home. She's just delaying the decision. But she's so frustrated in the space because it's just full of delayed decisions. And sometimes, yes, the decisions are very hard. They can be very, very hard. But I'm telling you, if you make them before you move, the frustration level is just not going to exist. You're really going to be excited to be in this new chapter, and you're not going to be weighed down with these gnawing leftover decisions. And the next two things kind of go hand in hand. So it's having an inventory and taking pictures because they're kind of simultaneous. Inventory, and we're not talking about writing down, I have six teaspoons and I have whatever. Not that. But you do want to know if you're starting to give stuff away, like if you want to remember what family member you gave something to, if you want to remember who you donated something to, there becomes a lot of confusion at moving time. It's a very stressful time for everybody. And when you're, there's a lot of different moving parts, you sometimes don't remember what's happened to certain things. And you might think the movers lost it, but actually you gave it to Goodwill three weeks ago, but you just didn't remember. Um, and we've been it will happen. It, will it does happen. happen. It will happen. Um, because stress does things to your memory. So just don't assume that you're going to be able to remember this. And the best way to take an inventory of stuff is this, right? So I mean, these long. cell phones were, you know, God love them and God hate them. But for this, love. Pictures. Pictures. That's all you have to do. Take pictures. Take pictures of your stuff. If you love the way that you have a vignette hung up of photos in your, take a picture of that wall and so when you move in, you know how to recreate it. But take a picture of your stuff. One, you'll know if there happens to be any moving damage. Hey, look, this armor did not have three legs when I, you know, you got it. Now it does. That's a problem. But it also allows you to know what you have, what the condition is, where to place it. It's just the easiest way free move to take an inventory of what you own is just to get out your cell phone and take pictures. Yes, for sure. And then labeling cords. I don't know what happens. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Pictures, this is a good one. Lamps and lampshade. Mm -hmm. Please take a picture of every lamp you have because they will disassemble lamp and lampshade and you're going to get to your home because people love lamps. We've seen people There's love lamps. lamps in the My world. mother also has like a room of lamps. You will not remember what lamp goes to what lampshade. It will be a fun game for about five seconds. You're going to be over it. I promise you. So take a picture of your lamp so you will know which lamp goes with which lampshade. Best piece of advice I can give you on, on that front. That is and one that causes confusion. It does. And then the cords. So everybody thinks that they're going to be really intentional with this. They're like, okay, I'm going to un unplug my DVD player and I'm going to put the cord in this box with it. And then somehow, I don't know what happens once you take the box up, but they like... Do this disappearing routine, and that cord jumps into another box, and the charger for your iPad jumps into that box, and then by the time you get somewhere, you have no idea what went with what, and you don't remember how to put it back up. And there are people that can help with that stuff too, um, that we've used, and they're wonderful, but you can save yourself a lot of time and stress by just labeling up again the same color tape. And there are other products too you can purchase, but color tape is an inexpensive way to do that. You know, put like red on the DVD player and, you know, whatever it is, because you're not going to remember. We all think that we are going to remember all these things and none of us are going to. No. And do it before you even unplug one thing in your house. Right. How to just Go look. around and start either labeling. You can use math and tape and just, you know, put it around where there's a flag and write on it. You know, and have everything. You can do a code, you can do a name, you can do a color. Before you unplug anything, match the mate up. Again, it will save you so much time and frustration with that. You will be very happy. Yes. Um, oh, there was one more thing about moving. So you've moved, 
you're home, you've unpacked. You're here, yay, arrive and thrive. What should you be doing, Tanya? Well, you've unpacked already, and a lot of times when you unpack, you're just getting stuff out of boxes and getting it near where it needs to be, right? You're trying to get the cardboard out and some semblance of order. So you're gonna start kind of organizing things based on what areas of the home that you use the most. And usually that's gonna be the primary bedroom, it's gonna be the kitchen, it's places where a lot of activity is going on, and you don't wanna run out and invest in a ton of organizing products and things before you actually live in the space. Because a lot of times, the things that you used to do in the old home don't make sense anymore. Like I struggled with this with a coffee maker, but I, kept, I wanted it to go one place, but my body kept taking me to another place every time, and I finally just moved it, because I was like, well, that's where my brain thinks it should be. So you just don't really know until you live. So give yourself some time to figure it out before you make all these investments in those things and just kind of discover how you use the space. Yeah, and really set your home up to work best for you. And we encourage, especially our senior clients, you're really thinking about, you know, let's not put heavy stuff up way tall where it's gonna fall on your head, you have to get a ladder every time you wanna make your favorite hash brown casserole. Similarly, don't put everything down where you're crawling on your knees trying to figure out, she's tall, she hates bending down. I didn't think about it as since I'm shorter. She's like, yeah, I hate being tall and bending down to get stuff. I was like, I really never would have thought of that. I don't mind bending, but I don't want to get on my hands. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to put stuff right. that, I mean, again, yeah. think about how you're going to access things and how often you access them. So if you have a turkey platter you use once a year at Thanksgiving, yes, put that up high or down low where you're not going to use it. But really, the things that you use the most should be front and center and easy to access. Do not booby trap yourself. Do not make things more difficult for yourself. Set it up to work best for you. Because everything's customizable. There is nothing that there isn't a solution for, right? And I know especially here at the farms, they work with people on closet designs and all of these things, making sure you get what you want. There are drawers that you can pull out, like by Shelf Genie and whoever, if you like things to pull out so you're not digging in the back of cupboards. There, there are a million different modifications you can make to make a space your own. And we encourage you to think about those once you've lived in the space. And then again, here I am with your timelines and deadlines. Seems to be my favorite thing to say. Give yourself a deadline to escort anything out that doesn't serve you in your new home and in your new life. So give yourself whatever that, again, it's a personal choice, but don't let it be hanging around if it doesn't serve you a purpose in your new space. There are some delayed decisions you're going to bring with you. We tell you not, but let's be honest. You're going to bring some stuff that you're unsure about. Set a timeline for that. Okay, if, uh, if I've lived here for three months and I haven't used X, Y, and Z, or I don't like the way it works in here, go ahead and let go of it. Because the longer it lurks around, it's going to grow roots and it's just going to keep lurking around. So it's going to be easier for you on the forefront. Give yourself that deadline and be like, you know what? I'm not using this. And escort it on out. That's it. I mean, an organized home, there isn't just one definition. An organized home is a space that works for you, you know what you own, you know where to find it, and you've intentionally made these decisions. You didn't just say, oh, this is all my stuff and I'm taking it with me. Um, so organized, it's, and again, it's a process, it's not a one-day event, it takes time. There are tons of people out there that can help you with this, y'all. It doesn't have to be Holly and I, I'm talking about, you know, we have great people we partner with, you know, super haulers that can clean out attics and garages. We have people that do digital photography or converting VHS tapes or whatever. There are a million resources. We'd be happy to share any of those with you. We've got a lot of stuff on the back table if anybody's interested in any of that. Um, but there are people out here to help you. So if you're thinking about this and you get stumped or you just have a question, we're always here. Um, our contact information is back there, but we are just happy to be able to share what we know and just kind of give you all a brief overview of what And we have a lot of resources on our website, so it's just springersisters.com. There are questions to ask yourself, decluttering questions. There are, um, is that there's a donate awareness sheet when you're writing down what you're donating and you're realizing what's the pattern of your excess. Like, are you donating things that are all bargain? Are you donating things that are all gifts? And again, back to the gifts and communication in our family, we're like, please don't give us gifts anymore. It's all experiences, right? We just want to spend time with each other and, you know, whether it's restaurants or concerts or whatever. Um, totally lost my parents. Shocking. Well, that, I mean, the last two years has taught us that, if nothing else. Like, we want to be around our people. So that's where, and hopefully not only with gifts, but with your moving and your decisions and your goals, that's what you're leaning towards is creating the best life for yourself, whatever that looks like for you, and spending time with the people you love. Yeah, and it, and it is scary, and we it is hard. And we, we are always very honored to walk into any home and experience anything with anyone. Again, we love stories, we love our clients, we love everything about it. Um, we know it's not easy, but every client we have helped, 
On the flip side, they're a convert. I mean, they'll say, we had one that we helped out to sell our house and move, and she, it's like, I feel like I've been ruined. Like, I like things looking clean and open, like she had had a lot of, a lot of decor. Um, we didn't consider that being ruined. We thought that was a win. Uh, but nobody ever regrets having the things they love around. That's what you had to remember. You're not getting rid of stuff. You're not erasing your life. You're keeping your favorite things, and you're going to have it where you can enjoy them all the time in your new space. And that's what's really important. We had the best of things. So thank y'all very much. And we have, if anybody has any questions about anything, don't hesitate to ask. We're here for that. Um, if anybody has any questions about anything. Such a big